Have you ever had that moment or that period where you wanted to just pack up one day and just disappear? To just leave everything behind and head out into the night and go as far away as you possibly can? Have you ever had that moment? Let's do that. Tonight, let's just disappear. I know that it is very different for everyone, but I wonder what does it mean for you to say that your life has fallen apart? As we drive away right now, what is it that you are leaving behind? I guess it could be a bad job or a terrible partner. Maybe it is a family that has made your life a living hell or maybe it is just a situation that you actually can't physically get away from. Maybe you lost your job or your business. Maybe you lost a partner, your mother, your father. Maybe it's your sister or your brother or your aunt who has everything to you. Maybe you've lost a child. Maybe your life falling apart wasn't necessarily an all of a sudden occurrence. Maybe it happened gradually over a long period of time and you woke up one day and realized just how far off you have veered from what you thought your life could be. Maybe you lost yourself, you lost you and you are mourning even though you have never really thought of it that way but deep down inside it is the grief that you're trying to get away from. This year, this COVID era has shown us loss that we can't really wrap our heads around. You know, like there was a time when we lost our freedom, which was all fun and games when they had said that lockdown was going to be just 21 days. If you remember, there was a time people were setting off Ama Cricket and it was like New Year's. But since then, so much has happened in the past two years. I got snacks. Well, just because we are running away from our problems doesn't mean that we must starve. So, anyway, where are we going? Like, where do where do people go when they are trying to get away from it all? Is it like that cabin in the woods by a beautiful lake, like in the movies? Or is it like a beach getaway with white sands and turquoise waters? Uh, maybe it's like a penthouse with an infinity pool or some mountain hideout. But this is South Africa, so Abolova will enter you if you try to be doing that in the forest. But sometimes life can get so heavy that you feel like there is no place on the entire planet where you can get away from the stresses of your life. I know for sure that for many, the thought of no longer being on this earth has crossed your mind probably more than once. 
Thinking about the impact of COVID, I remember this story that I read about somewhere online earlier in the year. It was on the evening when the president announced that we were going back to level 4. The person who had posted the story said that they had been in a restaurant having dinner and they were watching the announcement on the TV. As soon as the president spoke, Alert level 4. All the waiters in the restaurant were visibly shocked because for them, level 4 meant that all the restaurants were going to close again. They were basically losing their jobs in that very moment. And it was heartbreaking reading about how the waiters started asking for extra tips from the customers because they knew that this would be the last time they earn any kind of income for the foreseeable future because only God knows when we move from different levels in our country. I would like to use this moment in that restaurant to share something with you. Let's say in the restaurant there were three waiters. Ndombi, Joshua, the white guy and Goodness. He's from Zim. All of them are in their early 30s or late 20s. So Ndombi for the past few years has been told that she has a calling but she's hasn't really felt that she had the capacity to focus on it or to put her life on on hold in order to see where it can take her. She's got a seven-year-old child and she lives with her grandparents. Goodness, on the other hand, he believes in the blood of Jesus against all odds. He is as staunch a Christian as they come. As for Joshua, he is an atheist and he's waitering while trying to figure out what to do with his life because he quit his BCom studies. So, in the restaurant, as the president uttered the words, level 4, all three of them basically lost their jobs. Now, Ndombi had been told that if she doesn't heed her calling and to go a Petrueni, then it means isn't like And those were her very thoughts in that moment when that announcement was made. She thought that she lost her job because she wasn't listening to her ancestors and was now being punished. Goodness, on the other hand, he was going through every single scripture that you could find in his head. John 16, verse 33. In the world, you will have tribulation, but take heart, I have overcome the world. Isaiah 41, verse 10. So do not fear, I am with you. Philippians 4, verse 6. You name it, he uttered it under his breath as he trembled to the kitchen, clanking dirty dishes and his meager tips that would probably not even get him to the apartment that he lives in somewhere in the dodgy part of town. For goodness, clearly God was testing him. Clearly. And it was in this very situation that he could show just how steadfast he was in his belief in the word of God. Then there's the young man Joshua. For him, it's the bloody ANC. If the government wasn't so corrupt, then we wouldn't need to go to level 4. But because they're just a bunch of sorties, this is where we are. And now, good businesses have to go under. For Canal man. For him, it was all bad politics and incompetent economics. When he got back home to his parents' house, he will arrive with a clean conscience knowing that he did his best in his job. So... There are three people having three different experiences of the exact same moment. I want to use this scenario to talk about how we create and give meaning to aspects of our lives and how this process impacts on how we evaluate to what extent our lives have fallen apart. Have you ever noticed how being broke or having money makes food taste different? As black people, most of us have that one meal that reminds us of how tough we once had it in life. Or still do. That meal that just brings trauma, Nje. It could be something like black tea with brown bread with nothing on it but butter. For someone else, it could be ipapa and cabbage. Or whatever meal that you feel hits you right in the field. Eating that meal just breaks your heart with every single bite. But, but, on payday, you could have the same meal and it tastes like something that you'd actually pay money for to eat in a restaurant. 
I mean, you can go to a restaurant and eat a leafy salad and it feels like you are literally glowing from the inside. But when you get home and all you can eat is leafy vegetables, you feel like this meal is the epitome of poverty. So what has happened? It is pretty much the same meal being eaten by the same person yet having two different experiences of it. What has changed? Well, what is happening is that you are experiencing the effects of the meaning that you have created and given to certain aspects of your life. When you were going through your period of financial difficulties when you were young, you associated Ipapa Nikabishi with that sense of poverty. And it is that association that initiated a protocol of something like mental processes that told your mind to experience the meal in a certain way. Yet, when you had a similar meal at a restaurant, you told your mind to experience that meal differently. So let's go back to our three waiters. What Ndombi, Joshua and Goodness are each experiencing is the impact of the meanings that they have created in their lives. Ndombi views life through the lens of ancestral anger. Goodness sees life as a test set by God. For Josh, he has been brought up to believe that black people are corrupt and useless criminals. Just like how we can experience Ipapa Nikabishi differently, our three waiters could, if they chose to, they could experience this level 4 announcement differently to how they were doing it in that moment. You see, to a very large extent, we define our experiences. I know what I'm saying may sound a bit vague, but oh, oh, we're here. Take, take the left on the ground. We just need to walk down into the valley. Don't don't fall. It's a bit slippery with the sand. Yeah, we we're here. There's nothing but desert all around us. It's just the night sky, the stars. And the rolling sand dunes all around us in this valley. We are here because there's something that I want to show you. Especially if you are deep within that space where you feel that your whole life has fallen apart. Consider this a kind of retreat, but just in your mind. I would like to teach you something. It's an approach to simplify your understanding of spirituality and how it relates to your life. Throughout most of the episodes on this podcast, we've dealt with spirituality in relation to our ancestors and healers and things like that. But right now, I want to talk about the spirituality of being you. You as a spiritual entity and how you navigate this weird thing called life. So, like I said, all around us, there are just sand dunes, the night sky, and a bright, bright moon. In front of you, there are a couple of chairs, eight chairs to be exact. There are seven chairs arranged in a half a circle, and in the middle of that half circle, there is the eighth chair. We will call it the chair in the middle, but we'll get back to this one. All the seven chairs are arranged facing the chair in the middle. So I would like you to stand in front of the chair in the middle, but don't sit, not yet. Just stand and look at the seven chairs around you. 
the half a circle of chairs start on your left hand side, evenly spaced out across to your right hand side. What we are about to do is a visualization exercise. Now, as you stand, I want you to look at the chair on the right, the very first chair on the right. This chair represents love. In this chair, I want you to picture you and how you imagine you would look when you are deeply, deeply in love. It could be romantic love with a loving partner, or it could be a family member, your newborn baby, or your annoying teen, or it could be you in your dream job. Whatever you know that has given you an experience of deep, all-encompassing love. How do you look when you are in that state? What are the types of things that you say? What kind of things do you talk about? What kind of things come out of your mouth? How does life in general look when you are in that state of deep, all-encompassing love? I want you to focus on how you look and now imagine that version of yourself sitting in that chair, that first chair on the right. Just imagine yourself being deeply in love. Imagine that version of yourself sitting in the chair. Just look, just observe and breathe. When I say just observe, I mean do not feel compelled to feel anything about what you are seeing. Just watch. By breathing, I'm not saying use some kind of meditative technique, no. Just breathe as normally as you can, but just be aware that you are breathing. The chair next to that one is the joy chair. What really brings you joy? What kind of moments make you cherish just being alive? It could be hanging out with your friends, it could be road trips, it could be museums, it could be family gatherings maybe, it could be hiking, it could be traveling, it could be chesanyam, it could be bottles of lady cricket, dead gong, like whatever. It doesn't really matter. How do you look when you are utterly, utterly joyful? Imagine that version of yourself sitting in that chair. Just observe and breathe. The next chair is the care chair. What do you care most about? Do you remember a time or a moment when you felt most cared for? It doesn't matter who it was with or when it was or whether or not it lasted. But do you remember how that moment felt? Do you remember when you truly cared about someone or something? Regardless of what happened, how would you look if you were experiencing that moment right now? How would it feel? Where in your body would you feel it? Imagine that version of yourself experiencing that feeling. Imagine that part of yourself sitting in that chair in front of you. Let that version of yourself sit gently in the chair and just observe and breathe. You are neither happy or sad for this person that you are seeing. You are simply observing and breathing. The next chair is the last chair. This is everyone's guilty pleasure. And it's a tricky one. 
but lust is as basic a human emotion as they get. And it can get messy, literally and otherwise, but it isn't just sexual lust as well. It can also be something of an intoxicating desire for something material like money and possessions or social status. It could be substances, and it could even be a bit more dark, like a desire for revenge or even for pain. It borders on an obsession, and it's something that you feel as if consumes your whole body and your own psyche, especially in the moment when it's happening. How do you feel? How do you look when you're going through that sensation? Picture that version of yourself and sit them down in their chair and just observe and breathe. The next chair is the grief chair. This is grief from the past or grief from something in the future or something that is happening in this moment. Sometimes it does happen that we grieve for something that hasn't even happened yet, yet we carry the pain of it somehow. It's like we preempt it so that it doesn't hurt so much or catch us off guard when it happens. Sometimes it could be grief over something that we hoped would happen, but it never did. Nonetheless, this is you at the lowest moment of your grief. How do you look? Here, you can let yourself cry. It doesn't have to be crying over anything specific. You don't have to do it just because we say it is healthy or important. Also, you don't have to feel shame about it. It's just like when you're hungry, just feel it. Sit that version of you gently on the chair and just observe and breathe. How would you sit? What would be your body language in that moment? How would you hold your head? How would you hold your body? How would you sit? How would your head sit? Where would you face? How do you normally imagine that you look when you're going through grief? Allow that image of yourself to go as far as you need to go or as far as you feel it can go. You're not condoning, you're not stopping, you're not shaming, you're not encouraging. You are simply watching the emotion run its course. Just assure yourself that you are in the safe space, the safe space that is you. The next chair is the anxiety chair. This is for those things, those situations or incidents that you fear so much that it feels like your whole heart itself will stop. This is or these are the reasons why you struggle to sleep at night. You wake up at half past two in the morning and your heart is pounding and your chest is tight. This is the feeling that has drained the color out of your life. How do you imagine you look when your anxiety is at its peak? What is your body language? What is your body movement? What are the types of things that you say to yourself when you are in that moment? Sit that version of yourself on the chair and just observe and breathe. The last chair is the anger chair. Those memories that you carry with you for what seem to be every single moment of your life. The memory of an incident or a moment or a situation your mind just seems to hold on to that moment in such a desperate way and it always seems to pop up when things don't go your way 
or another in something that happens in your life. Just when things go wrong, this is the memory that is always first to come to your mind. What kind of anger is it? It could be an exploding rage where you want to throw the chair or break things. Or it could be a simmering anger that seems to paralyze you. At its worst, what do you look like when you're in the midst of anger? Do you shout? Do you swear? Do you throw the chair or do you just sit and let it wash over you? Let that version of you sit in the chair and just watch and breathe. What you have in front of you is what you call your reality. In varying ways, these are the different aspects of who you are. These chairs are the source and the result of the meanings that you have created or embraced and now define your experience of the world. When you say you want to get away from it all, this is what you're trying to get away from. It is through these chairs that you have determined that your life has fallen apart. And in each of these seven chairs, Ipapa and Ikabishi actually taste differently. When I said that you must just observe and breathe, I mean that you do not cast judgment on what you're seeing in those chairs. You do not condone, you do not comfort, you do not discourage. Imagine it as you are people watching at your favorite hangout spot. You see different people experiencing their day each in their own unique way. This is pretty much the same approach. You just observe with no attachment to any specific person or feeling. Do not get me wrong, I'm not saying that you should deny what you are feeling through this exercise. I'm not saying that you should be despondent because despondency is a state of mind itself. In fact, what you are actually doing through this exercise is that you are giving yourself the opportunity to feel all of your emotions. Very often in our daily lives, we do not feel what we want to feel. We do not feel what we have to feel. We conform to what we feel is acceptable in our society. And there's never room to feel the full spectrum of our emotions. And what you're doing in this moment is that you're letting your emotions be what they are. You're just watching yourself in each chair or even just one chair for now. You watch yourself letting that emotion run its entire course without encouraging it or trying to manage it. You are not saying that it is right to feel that way or it is wrong to feel that way. You let go of one thing to control the feeling. You just let go. You observe and you breathe. The big question that will arise from this is then, if those sitting on the seven chairs are all aspects of who you are, then what is sitting in the eighth chair, the chair in the middle? This is the part in the movie where the old wise man says, It goes by many names. In the East, they call it the silent witness. Some call it the presence. Others call it the inner self. Others simply call it awareness. In Christianity, it is the stillness from the verse, Be still and know that I am God. In African esoteric philosophy, it is known as Ntu, from which we derive the word Umuntu and Ubuntu. 
It is the beingness of self. However, I want you to know that each and every one of these terms and phrases is utterly insignificant. It does not matter in any way that you know these phrases or you know what their meanings are. And there are two reasons for this which are as simple as they are profound. The first reason is that the word flower is not a flower. The word mountain is not a mountain. The word beauty is not beauty. The word flower does not give you the impression of what you would experience if you were to see the entity that is a flower with your own eyes. The word mountain does not capture the sheer magnitude of Mount Everest. The word beauty cannot capture even slightly what a mother sees when she's looking at her baby sleeping. Similarly, the word God is not God. The word God in every single description we've ever used for God is not God. The second reason is that in all the names and all the words and phrases for absolutely everything in this world, all of them exist inside the human mind only and absolutely nowhere else. This has then given us the impression that if a word or phrase for something does not exist, then it necessarily means that that thing itself does not exist or at a deeper level that this thing cannot be accessed by human experience. Words and names and phrases are important to help us to conceptualize our world and to communicate with each other. But words of themselves are not the world and nor do they fully capture our experience of the world and much more so if we were talking about things that actually lie beyond our human experience. Here, the most relevant question is not what sits in the chair in the middle, but who. Who is the one who sits on the chair in the middle? Outside of your emotions and outside of all your thoughts about the world and your emotions, who are you? This is a tricky question to answer and you're probably asking yourself, does the one sitting in the chair in the middle not feel emotions or do they not think about anything or the world or emotions themselves? These are very important questions, but the truth is that there actually isn't an answer for them. At least not an answer that we can process. It's like this... Imagine explaining the color blue to someone without making reference to anything that is blue. Or try explaining the color green to someone who was born blind. We have no frame of reference for what we are trying to describe in the chair in the middle. We do not know what lies beyond our thoughts and our feelings. And in many ways, we are not built to comprehend it. However, the one in the chair in the middle can be experienced through a very simple exercise of observing the seven chairs and just breathing. You're probably thinking that I'm making it sound overly simplistic and it's probably more complicated than what I'm saying, but it's actually not. But you will encounter a few challenges. You have to remember that our bodies and our minds are living organisms and they can't help but do certain things. Your body can't help but feel sensations and emotions and your mind can't help but to think. As a result, both our bodies and our mind have tricked us into believing that our emotions and sensations and our thoughts are who we are. This is why the idea of sitting outside of your emotions and your thoughts seems relatively impossible. So this presents you with your first challenge. This sense of uncertainty or groundlessness. Our minds need certainty and they communicate this need to our bodies. 
When you are not certain about something in your mind, it seems as though the ground that you are standing on is not solid. If I say observe yourself while going through grief, your mind will tell your body that it needs to feel the grief or it needs to comfort that grief. And that will be your first instinct to want to comfort. To just observe without attachment to that emotion feels too uncertain. If I say to you observe yourself in the throes of love without attaching to that feeling, without wanting to feel it yourself, that itself feels uncertain. You want to encourage the feeling. You want to join in. You want to share in how it feels. In order to do the chair exercise, what you first need to do is that you need to be able to develop a capacity to stop yourself from walking over to the seven chairs and condoning or comforting or chastising. What you are actually doing in this process is that you are developing a capacity to function without closure. And you may be wondering why would you want to be able to function without closure? And well, it's because it is in our need for closure that we compel ourselves to define our experiences of life according to the meanings that we have created or embraced. And it is only through those meanings that we feel that we can experience our world. We define our life's experiences according to whatever chair we happen to identify with in that situation or in that moment. But we will come back to this point. Let us go back to our three waiters. Let's start with Untombi. She has been told that she has a calling and she needs to heed that calling and that her losing her job is the result of the consequences of her not listening to her ancestors. So what will doing this exercise do for her? Well, for one thing, the way that African spirituality has been packaged, especially in our generation, is that we predominantly filtered through negative chairs between lust, grief, anxiety, and anger. On top of that, there is an intense focus on signs or spiritual messages and what they could possibly mean. I've had lots of conversations with people around the issue of ancestral messages and their interpretations, and what I have noticed is that more often than not, we are looking for validation for what we want certain dreams and occurrences to mean. And that is because we have a deep desire for closure. What this means is that we are actually projecting our own narrative into those ancestral messages. And thereby we alter the meaning to fit what we feel is what our guides should be communicating or what we feel God should be doing about the situation that we are in. We also attach meaning to certain messages based on the particular chair that we generally identify ourselves as most of the time. Here's an example. If a particular message is communicated to Ndombi while she is struggling with anxiety or grief, even if it's something small, like maybe one day on the day that she lost her job, she couldn't find her wallet or she couldn't find her house keys or her phone, she will interpret this as just more bad luck. On the other hand, had she been in a totally different state of being, let's say she was going on her first date with her crush and the exact same thing happened, like not being able to find her phone, that process or that incident or that occurrence would send her into a giddy yet excited panic. And it will be something that she will probably laugh about during her date. Or what is most common is that when you are in a negative state of being, all messages, no matter how positive or helpful, are interpreted negatively. The truth is that Ntombi actually hated her job. Her manager was abusive and her colleagues basically just depleted her energy each and every day. Through the chair exercise, Ntombi can interpret the messages from her guides without projecting her insecurities into the meaning of those messages. In that moment, when she senses Uvalo or Letsualo around her chest, 
She can take a moment to simply breathe and observe and scan through all the chairs to find where this sensation carries the most resonance. And she can do this without collapsing into her emotions or letting it decide for her how she should be experiencing that message or that moment. So what about the young man Joshua? He probably looks like he wouldn't benefit anything from this exercise. And maybe not. If he took a moment to step away from his sense of self, he will see the fallacy of what he sees as his superior sense of morality as a white person. Like when his parents got him a puppy to teach him responsibility and compassion, but they never told him what John, the gardener, what his real name is. Or why is it that he has never seen Miriam, the helper, ever go on sick leave? He doesn't even know the names of Miriam's kids, despite the fact that she is actually the one who raised him. Josh might just realize that his privilege was built on the backs of the people that he thinks offer no value to him, or that he and John and Miriam are just cogs in the same machine. Maybe then it will make sense why he has been struggling with depression since he was 14, and why he has fallen into drugs and annual stints at expensive rehab facilities. Or maybe why he quit his studies and started waitering to keep his parents off his back. Because he never really knew who he is. The plans for his life and who he is or should be seem to have been laid out for him without anyone even consulting him. Maybe, just maybe, through this exercise, just for a moment, he can get off the roller coaster and for once just watch it hurtling across the tracks and he can just catch his breath. What about goodness? Well, goodness, just like Ntombi, he has inherited the gospel of the nobility of suffering from his family and his community. It would be too easy to take aim at colonial Christianity and its impact on Africans and and I hope that by now you know that I do not believe in trying to speak negatively about anyone's spiritual beliefs. So I will not speak about what Christianity did or did not do in Africa but I will touch on how the Christian gospel itself has been translated in Africa. We spoke earlier about how hunger feels different when you are broke versus when you have money. When you are hungry because you can only afford one or two small meals a day, compared to when you are hungry because lunchtime hasn't arrived yet or you are stuck in a very long meeting, these two feelings of hunger are worlds apart. When you are hungry and broke, there is a certain sadness to it, a certain bitterness, even a level of anger and resentment, and probably shame as well. Yet, when you are hungry on payday, that feeling is... At most, just annoying. Heck, you might even be excited about the prospect of what you're going to eat later on. After having spent half my life in the Christian church, I can say that from my personal experience, there's a way in which the Bible has been interpreted in Africa that has inculcated a deep level of broke hunger. There's a desperate and utterly debilitating nature to the hunger of Africans for the word of God. I believe that it is this type of hunger that finds virtue in unrelenting, never-ending strife and hardship as a function of piety or devotion to God. Goodness expects to suffer. Ironically, it is a deep lust for many African Christians to prove just how much that they can endure. It may be that it hasn't occurred to goodness that it is only Africans and other native peoples around the world who endure soul-crushing hardship as an integral part of being Christian. Or it may be that he believes that Africans are more deserving of God's wrath because of our obsession with witchcraft and devil worshipping and such things. Or maybe it is just that it is our lot as Africans to suffer. This reminds me of that verse that says, For whoever has, to him more will be given, and he will have abundance. But whoever does not have, even what he has, will be taken away from him. Perhaps there is something in this verse that Christians on the African continent have not quite figured out. 
Perhaps if goodness did this exercise, he might, as he sits and looks at the seven chairs in front of him. He might be able to finally be still and know who God is, to detach himself from the worldly desires and understand what it truly means to be in this world, but not of this world. I have said this before, but it is very easy to interpret this exercise as a way of running away from your feelings or acting as if they don't affect you. But it really is the opposite. We do live in a society where most of our emotions have to be pushed down. And this is especially true in our woke culture where the idea of self-care generally translates into living a kind of perpetual state of bliss where you cut out all negativity. Positive vibes only, as we say. We insist that you should only ever feel certain emotions and not others. We demand that you feel things like anger only at certain times or in relation to certain things or topics and not to be angry about certain other things. We have a very unhealthy relationship with our emotions and it really, really shows. This exercise can help you heal your relationships, especially with people who you don't want to interact with right now or those who are no longer around. You simply look at yourself as you interact with those different people. It could be that as you do the exercise, across the seven chairs there are different people. On the love chair, you're with someone. On the joy chair, you're with someone else. Right across, right up until the anger chair. It could be seven different people. It could be 14 different people. You can turn each of the seven chairs into a bench. And you can sit with several people. You can use this process to have all the conversations that you wanted to have. Or at the very least, to give yourself the opportunity to say all the things that you've actually wanted to say in those emotions to those people. These can be very transformative conversations, even though they're one-sided, provided that you are being truthful, which can be tricky because very often we augment our memories and we distort them to fit our narrative. We use people and situations that have caused us harm as shields to hide the times and situations where we were complicit or we were responsible for creating harmful situations for others. The one thing that I do have to warn you about is that while all of these chairs are normal and natural human emotions, every single one of them has a shadow side. It is easier to see this with lust, but all of our emotions have a dark and a light side to them. But perhaps that is a conversation for another day. I know that I have not said much about the chair in the middle or the one sitting in the chair in the middle. The truth is that there isn't much to say and it would be a terrible injustice for me to even try to articulate at length who sits in the chair in the middle. What I can say and what I do feel I have to emphasize is that the one sitting in the chair in the middle is not something to worship or to pray to or to honor or to venerate. This is not yet another spiritual philosophy or belief that I'm introducing you to where you now have to follow a new set of rules and ways of getting things wrong. In many ways, you are actually already doing this exercise. I'm just making you more aware of it and asking you to use it in a way that will help you instead of hurt you. Ultimately, the aim of this process is to get you to reevaluate the process of creating meaning in your life and how you attribute and how you attribute that meaning to different aspects of your living experience. If I give black tea the meaning of poverty, then I will then have to deal with the reality of that process, which is that I will never ever enjoy black tea. 
a good example of how the meanings that we create impact on us is the placebo effect. If a doctor gives me a pill or an injection that in reality has no medicinal value, but I give that pill or injection the meaning of good health, I tell my body what to experience and I tell it to experience good health. And it is that very act of taking control that the exercise of the chairs is there for. To say that no emotion can actually dictate to you how you function or how you view your life. If something happens that makes you angry, you can, first of all, let yourself feel that anger. But what is different is that once you have observed that anger, it does not decide how you react. It does not compel you to do things that you do not want to do. To put it in woke terms, it does not trigger you. You know, the idea of being triggered is that if something triggers me, I will then take that incident and use it as a key of some sort to open the memory boxes of all the other things that have ever hurt me or upset me. And I will let those emotions out and let them run free as if those past hurts have just happened in this very moment. What we do is that we want to hold the person who triggered us responsible for us opening all those doors and being unable to deal with the emotional turmoil that results from it. The reality is that when that incident or person that triggered you is no longer there, you are still the one curled up in a corner, surrounded by your demons that you refuse to confront. Being triggered comes from the belief that you cannot feel what you feel. And for whatever reason, you try to bury those emotions, maybe out of guilt or shame. And then should something triggering happen to you, you shift that guilt or shame to someone else and feel your feels as much as you want. That's generally what we do when we are triggered. We try to guilt and shame. But this is not to say that people should not be called out for harmful behavior. Our society will never be better or heal if we don't do that. But what I am saying is that once you have a truly intimate relationship with your anger, you can react to situations that anger you without being triggered. You can deal with the moment and most importantly, you can let it go without locking it up with the rest of your trigger points. Your chest is less tight, your heart is lighter, and you have one less item in your carry-on luggage. This is really what this exercise is about. For you to get to know your emotions intimately, all of them. And in so doing, your emotions do not give the meanings to aspects of your life that will end up causing you further harm. The actual process of doing this exercise is not and should not be complicated. Remember, it is like people watching. You can do this as a formal routine as part of your process of ukupasa or prayer. Or you can do it as a part of a program that you create for yourself that can take weeks if not months even. You can also do it for brief moments throughout your day. You can do it in a taxi or during a meeting. Actually, this might be a bit more interesting if you actually get to doing it. Here's how it works. When you are in a taxi or in a meeting, look at all the people around you and realize that every single one of them in different ways represents an aspect of you. All of them, each in a different way. Now, imagine that the chair that you are sitting on is the chair in the middle and you are simply observing different aspects of yourself going through their emotions. Simply look at the people around you. Observe and breathe. You do not encourage. You do not condone. You do not push away. You just observe and you breathe. I want to make it clear that this process is not a cure. It is not a solution. What it will do for you is whatever you allow it to do. And most importantly, it is not a replacement for professional mental health services. In the simplest way, this exercise can be described as hui mamela, guzmamela. I know this generally means to kick back and relax, but 
in this context, it is an active and conscious process of listening to yourself, of listening to emotions. And you don't even have to do it when you're going through certain emotions. And in fact, it would be more beneficial for you to do it when nothing is happening. This will go a long way in reducing the intensity of your triggers. You do not try to learn to ride a horse by jumping on a horse that's already running at full speed. The most fundamentally important thing to understand about this process and specifically the seven chairs is that every one of them is temporary. Very often we feel or identify ourselves with a certain emotion simply because for whatever reason over time we have trained our minds to only alert us when those particular feelings are active within us. The rest of the time we are oblivious to any other feelings. Here's a quick exercise that you can do for the next few days. Count how many red cars you see on the road. At first, you'll be shocked just how often you can spot a red car. But a few days later, you'll probably never remember seeing a blue car. This is essentially what we have done to our minds for most of our lives, especially when we have grown to define ourselves according to certain emotions like anger or hurt. If you generally see yourself as being sad, you will ever hardly notice the moments when you are actually happy, no matter how brief those moments are. But in reality, we go through a wide range of emotions on a daily basis. So what our minds do is that they have this tape that they play in our minds over and over again that bring us back to the emotions that we feel is the entirety of our being. It is that scenario that we once went through, that, that such a situation that has ingrained us, itself in our minds and we enact it countless times to reinforce our beliefs about our state of being. It is that scenario that has hurt us or made us angry or disappointed or whatever. You play it over and over and over in your head literally hundreds of times a day. And whenever someone asks you genuinely how you are doing, you first play out the scenario in your head. You play out that scene, you replay that tape. And it is out of that dominant feeling that it reiterates that you answer the question of how you are doing. So, to a tragically large extent, this is just a habit that you have developed and not necessarily an emotion that you are feeling. It is a habit, almost an addiction, that we have created over time. That pain, that anger, that sadness, it has become a kind of a safe place for us. It has become our comfort zone. It has become what we know, no matter how harmful it is. I remember the first time when I went to go get glasses. One of the things that really struck me was how bad my eyesight actually was. And I wasn't even aware of it. And I'll never forget what the optometrist said at that time. He said that our bodies can basically get used to just about anything if we give it time. No matter how harmful that situation or that thing is, over time, our bodies will get used to it and it will become comfortable. When you say that your life has fallen apart, you are basically saying that you have an expectation that was not met. That is the most objective way that you can look at any situation really. Something that you expected to happen did not happen. I don't want to make the mistake of making this seem like some kind of motivational don't don't, but regardless of your current situation, you can actually still take the time to get to know your emotions intimately. Your assumption may be that you do not have the state of mind to do this exercise. One of the most devastating realities that many people in our country live with is that of being unemployed. Not having an income has driven many people to the edge and beyond in some instances. The truth is that even in that situation, you are not sad or depressed the whole day. You actually have moments when you're feeling other emotions. And you have also moments where you're actually not necessarily feeling anything at all. 
And it is in those moments that you can do this exercise. Here's another quick trick that you can use to get yourself in a state of mind to do this exercise. Give someone that you care about a genuine and heartfelt compliment. If you don't have such a person that you can contact quickly, you can do it with a total stranger. Personally, I like doing it with cashiers and shops. If you feel that you can't talk to anyone in that moment, just picture that stranger or someone that you know being truly and deeply happy. Imagine that they have received the best news of their life. Have fun picturing the different reactions or how their smile looks or how their laughter sounds. In that moment, the very best thing they could have ever wanted in life has just happened and you got to witness it. Be warned though, it could lead you to be very, very emotional, but in a good way. What this process will do is that it will push back on the heaviness of your negative emotions and you will be in a more neutral state to do the exercise. It would be naive and inconsiderate of me to imply that the effects or the impact of unemployment can be fixed easily with a mental or spiritual process. However, when you are unemployed, you still live, you still eat, you wash, you sleep, and in many ways you do your best to take care of yourself. In that same way, you can take a few minutes to make this exercise a part of the process of taking care of yourself. You can just give yourself a moment just to catch your breath. There was a day when I was still writing this episode when something strange happened. While I was sitting at the desk typing, I felt a strange sense of sadness. It was a physical sensation that began somewhere in the middle of my chest. At first, it felt like a little knot just beneath my lungs and, and it slowly grew to fill up my whole upper body. Naturally, I did what we all do. I tried to figure out what was it that had triggered this feeling. What was it that was making me sad? I went through all my sadness memories, but nothing connected. There was no memory that resonated with that feeling that I was feeling in that moment. So, I decided to stop trying to find a reason for what I was feeling. And I simply sat and I observed. I sat with the sadness. I closed my eyes and I could feel the tears beginning to gather somewhere inside my eyelids. I felt my mouth tighten into a frown and I felt my chin begin to tremble. I was convinced that I was going to break down and cry and I tried my best not to fight it and to just let it. And then as strangely and as suddenly as that feeling came, it left. My body calmed, my chest opened, and my face relaxed. All of this happened in about two or three minutes. It was as though a visitor came and left without saying anything. What I remember distinctly was that that feeling did not leave any lingering effect. I didn't get stuck in reimagining a sad moment. Also, there was no message, no meaning. I tried to figure out what actually happened, but I don't think I ever will. Not now anyway. But it did get me to think about how often has this actually happened? How often have I actually gone through such an experience? And not just with sadness, but with other emotions. And I insisted on attaching that feeling to a memory that may or may not be the reason why I was feeling that way. And I forced that memory to stick to that feeling and subsequently I suffered the consequences. The consequences of that meaning that I was attaching to that feeling. In recent years I've also had strange moments when I've been overcome by a sense of deep and all pervasive love and joy out of nowhere. And in the beginning it used to really freak me out. 
Um, and maybe it's because I felt like it was some spiritual experience that I couldn't fight, quite figure out. But looking back, what I did with this current situation is what I did back then. I let the feeling come, but I did at times try to attach meaning to it. I would imagine all the sources of love in my life, but I realize now that none of those memories actually connected to that feeling. It was a feeling that came of its own accord, and in a few seconds or in a few minutes, it left just like that. Ultimately, the aim of this exercise is to allow you to reevaluate how you create meaning in your life. In all the seven chairs, we are the ones that create meaning. It is easy for us to talk about what the meaning of love or joy is, but not so much the meaning of grief or fear or anger. We are very willing to allow ourselves to learn what love can teach us about ourselves and about life, but we are less keen to learn from grief. And that's how we lose out on giving grief a meaning in our life. We treat anger as an enemy and not as a guide. And this is a big reason why we believe that our ancestors' anger is there only for punishment and not as a way for us to learn about ourselves and the world. Maybe it is time to start picking up the pieces of our lives that we believe have fallen apart. But not with the intention of putting them back together, but to just look at them outside of the meanings that we have inherited or embraced. Maybe you might begin to see them not as broken pieces, but whole worlds within themselves. Maybe then we can begin to give our lives the meaning that lies outside of the seven chairs and connect with something that is far, far deeper and infinitely and more profoundly divine. The sun is coming up, morning is approaching, the sky is beginning to glow with shades of oranges and reds and purples and pinks. On the other side of the sky, there are dark storm clouds gathering with faint flashes of lightning. You know what that means? Nothing. It means nothing at all, except for what you want it to mean. This is the last episode for the year, the end of season two. I'm going to take a little break. My name is Vusum Zingrande. I pray that God bless you and all your guides. May all the beings of light and love from all dimensions and across all of time be with you. May God's love vibrate throughout your mind, your body, and your spirit. Makwande. <laughs>